this case, a patient that has a trauma resulted in high above knee amputation with very short residual femur of less than 13 centimeters in total length. So we have to modify the standard approach of OC integration to accommodate for the short length and utilize the maximum bone that is available for us. He's not a good candidate for thumb lengthening due to the soft tissue strains. So we have to use a different technique with OC integration, putting the implant down the femoral neck. Moving to the patient, you can see that the soft tissue is very disorganized. The bone is sitting subcutaneously here and then you have majority of the musculature lying down at the back without any connection to the bone. So he doesn't have much control on his femur and he has fixed flexion deformity due to the fact that the iliopsoas is still attached. At the same time, we do the OC integration we have to reorganize all the musculature around the bony stump in order to give him more control on the residuum and to balance the power of flexion, adduction, abduction, and extension. I utilize the old scar. It's large aroma. There is big bursa. I try to excise the bursa completely rather than go through it. This bursal tissue can be a source of deep-seated infection. You can see there is significant bony prominence here and there is no periosteum down to around one centimeter from the distal end and the muscles start attaching above that. I identify the level of resection of the bone to remove the remnant that is not functional. The distal end of the bone didn't seem too healthy. You can see it's very ebonated and it's ivory color. We identify the canal. We have to be extremely careful when identifying the canal as this is the most important step with regards to the bony resection. If the trajectory is wrong, we will lose the structural integrity distally. As you can see, we resected the distal end of the femur perpendicular to our trajectory. We try to access the canal in an oblique manner. This would be a good start. As you can see on the lateral view, it looks perfect in the center of the canal and it's going toward the femoral neck. I exchange the initial rima with a guide wire. We start leaning in an oblique trajectory. You can see I'm pushing the rima laterally at the entry point to avoid breaching the medial cortex. This is very important in the circumferential integrity of the distal cortex. You can see the rima is maintaining its trajectory. We're starting to get some dreams from the canal, which would be healthy for bone graft. Sequential reaming continues until we reach the bizarre diameter. I still don't feel any chatter in the middle of the canal, which means that there is a bit of reaming to go. This is number 14 Rima. I remove the guide wire and I try with a brooch initially. You can see the brooch is curved. I use the curve parallel to the calcar curve. It's very difficult to negotiate that path. It's looking very promising as the path is what we designed. After finishing with the flexible rima at the level of 14 millimeters, I then use a specialized curved rasp to rasp the lateral border in line with the medial calca. Very gently, I push my curved rasp laterally. This doesn't generate much heat and it's much more controlled. I gradually increase the size of the rasp. At all expense, I avoid perforating the medial side. 
This is size 15 now. It's getting harder to insert. So we may go back to the renas. You can see the path for the implants on the x-ray and the lateral cortex of the femur at the distal end is green for it. We now go back to the flexible rema to ring further. We keep collecting the bone graft. And we go back to the brooch. This is a size 17 brooch. We are getting some rotational stability. <coughs> this is a size 18 implant and it's rotationally stable. I think that's the size that we have to stop with. We'll check the x-ray on the lateral. The implant trajectory is exactly where we find it. Very central into the head and central in the canal. The next step, we use a calca rima or um, surface cutter. This is to make a smooth surface at the distal end for the collar to sit on very important that we have to be very meticulous at the bone implant interface and by removing the soft tissue you would maximize the chance of its integration this by itself will reduce dramatically any chance of infection the next step is performing bone grafting we have collected significant amount of bone graft and we insert the bone graft into the canal Care should be taken not to create a fat emboli. I leave some of the bone graft for the distal end. Any chance of mismatch between the collar of the implant and the distal end of the bone. I gently press the bone graft into the canal. And the last step is inserting the implant. We customized an implant for the purpose of the surgery. The implant should go by hand down to the porous surface or the distal 8 centimeters. We check every step with x-ray. You can see the proximal end of the implant has been beveled to avoid any stress riser at the femoral neck. We impact the implant gently and very slow. This is the step where there is a high chance of fat emboli. Inserting the implant needs to be very slow and I can see that there is significant resistance with impaction which is very reassuring. The implant is rotationally stable as you can see. We precisely measured the size of the implant during the customization and the perioperative planning. We are 3 millimeters away from the base and at this stage I insert the rest of the graph around the collar. This bone graph will further facilitate the OC integration at the distal implant bone interface. This patient will be loaded immediately in order to prevent bone resorption. This is a massive differential point from doing two-stage surgery. The implant is seated on the bone and you can hear the change in the tone. You can see the position of the implant in the neck is perfectly located and distally the implant is seated exactly at the distal end of the bone. The implant is positioned perfectly on the lateral view. Nicely positioned on the distal end as well. This procedure is equally important when it comes to soft tissue management and bony management. You can see the soft tissue is all retracted and we need to bring it all distally and utilize whatever muscle is left hanging at the posterior aspect. You can see muscle tissue at the back here. By gently releasing it, we can achieve a better myoplasty effect. One of the most important aspects of this part is to cover the bone implant interface with its bone graft.
After doing nearly 1,000 OS integration procedures, one cannot say that we have mastered this technique. We continue to learn from our experience from doing more complex cases. The first and most important step of the soft tissue management has been achieved. You can see the implant and bone interface is totally covered with vascularized tissue and bone is underneath it with bone graft. This provides a seal from any bacterial invasion. Some critiques may think that this is naive thinking. However, as I mentioned before, we have done almost a thousand cases and this technique has proven its efficacy in reducing the chance of any bony infection, especially when we compare it to the older technique when we didn't do this part of the operation. I then move on to reconstructing the muscular part. I start with the lateral aspect as usually is the most efficient part. I do a few interrupted sutures and then continuous for the fascia layer. It's very important to eliminate the dead space. You can see that the procedure is performed from inside out and there will be continuous fashioning and refashioning of the soft tissue until we reach the best soft tissue position around the bone. This would maximize the functionality of the residual muscle, eliminate dead space and provide even cosmesis or a reasonably shaped stump. You can see that there is no dead space and we eliminated pretty much most of the redundancy but we have significant amount of residual fat and skin so it is at a stage where we can trim that as well. So you can see the overhanging at the back is reduced dramatically. We will continue to lift more up until we reach that satisfactory point. Soft tissue stability at the distal end of the implant is paramount. Movement creates inflammation, inflammation leads to infection. I think it's reasonable that we can position our stoma at this point. I use a coring device to open a precise circular stoma. You can see that the soft tissue is very well stabilized. Very satisfied with this procedure, we managed to achieve bony stability and very good soft tissue reconstruction by reducing the sag of the soft tissue and utilizing whatever muscle available in a more functional manner. And uh, at the implant bone interface, we minimize any kind of movement. So I'm optimistic that this patient will be able to achieve good results with uh, good mobility. Thank you.